Hi, so in this video I'm going to be talking about how we can do compositions of uh, linear transformations and also how we can find some standard matrices from some, I guess, uh, some worded examples rather than some actual uh, algebraic examples. So let's first start by finding some of the standard matrices for these uh, different linear transformations defined here. So we have F, which is a rotation transformation going for an uh, angle, um, 3 pi on 4. And then we have G, which is the orthogonal projection onto some line in R2, and H, which is dilution, um, and that's also in R2. So really, um, I guess the key thing to notice here is that they're all in R2, which makes our life easier, because I guess we can think, well, okay, any of them can be, I guess, multiplied with each other, and that's really the key thing you should be thinking of when you hear the idea of composition of linear transformations, you should be thinking of multiplying standard matrices together, because that's really fundamentally what it is. So the key thing in this video is, I guess, finding these standard matrices. The actual composition part itself is pretty straightforward. Let's start with H, because it is by far probably the easiest one here. Uh, then we'll look at F, and then we'll look at G. So, looking at H, and the good thing is I can have it there, on the screen, but let's find h little s. We imagine h as being something like h x y, because it's in R2, and really when we think about h x y having a standard matrix, we're really thinking of the following. We're thinking that we have some standard matrix, we input a vector, and I'm just going to call that input vector P, just so we don't get confused. Most people use X here, but I don't want you to get confused with the um, actual input and the vector. Um, so HSP equaling some vector W, for example. So really just thinking here, and it's almost intuitive what the standard matrix is here, but when we're thinking about dilution um, by square root 8, uh, then really what we should be thinking of is that we are really just going to, uh, I guess, um, dilute the actual vectors by a factor of square root 8. And the diluting part, I guess, alludes to the fact that we are going to be making it smaller by a factor of square root 8. So, when it comes to diluting by square root 8, it's not actually the same as multiplying by square root 8, because dilution implies that we are that we're weakening it, or making it smaller. So when we consider the h of s, we know as per all standard matrices, we have to have the h of 1, 0 here, and the h of 0, 1 here because remember the columns of a standard matrix of a linear transformation will be the basis of that too, the standard basis for that transformation. So um, we are diluting by 8, so we're essentially multiplying by 1 on square root 8 to dilute it by square root 8. And that's the x component, because we're imagining here the x component. So we're diluting the x component like that, and then we're diluting the y component. And that's how we get the standard matrix for a dilution. And that should sort of be intuitive. If we wanted to, say, um, expand, or, or expand by a factor of 2, or multiply by a factor of 2, then we'd have 2 there and 2 there. But really, it's just a matter, I guess, of um, thinking about the x component and the y component, and the fact that we want to essentially multiply them by some vector p to get our output w. So there's our standard matrix h. So let's consider anti-clockwise rotation by 3 pi on 4. So let's consider the standard uh, matrix. I'm going to call this F dashed S for now because it's not the standard matrix specific to S. It's actually a general form for a standard matrix of rotation anti-clockwise. And the standard form is cosine theta, negative sine theta. And what we have here is sine theta, and we have cosine theta. And if you want to do a clockwise rotation, you just take the transposes matrix. But this is the general form for uh, anti-clockwise rotation. And 
And so when we look at this, when we consider our specific case, we're looking for Fs, and this is anticlockwise rotation for an angle 3 pi on 4. Cos of 3 pi on 4, sine of 3 pi on 4, negative sine of 3 pi on 4, cos of 3 pi on 4. Okay, so we consider like our unit circle, for example, and 3 pi on 4 is going to be an angle out there. So when we think about cosine, we think about x, so clearly it's going to be negative. So um, whenever we think about divide, an angle that has a, div a divisor of 4 here, we really should be thinking 1 on the square root 2. So really, we can see, because it's going to be negative uh, x, we're going to have a negative value of cosine, and we're thinking 1 on root 2, so it's got to be negative 1 on root 2. Now sine is the y, so obviously it's going to be positive here, but we've got a negative out the front of the sine, so it's actually going to be negative 1 on square root 2. Uh, sine of 3 pi on 4, well, as I said, that's going to be 1 on square root 2, because it's like the y direction, it's clearly positive here, and cos is negative because it's like x. So there's our standard matrix there. Key thing is to remember this general form, and if you're you know, don't believe me that this is the general form, well, you can look this up on Wikipedia, but uh, you can always consider the f of x, y, and you can consider what this actually means. So if we consider the uh, actual matrix here, well, we can break it down to be x, lots of cos, theta, sine, theta, plus y, lots of uh, negative sine, theta, cos theta. That's how we can simply write it, I guess, as uh, these two components there. But we can imagine what we have here as uh, being, I guess, component-wise, x cos theta being the first key one there, and then we have take y sine theta being the second key component, and then we have x sine theta plus y cos theta here. And we can just consider, I guess, an arbitrary angle. So let's consider rotation through zero degrees, because this one's going to make the most sense to check. And we consider rotation through zero degrees. We have x cos zero, take y sine zero, x sine zero, plus y cos zero. Think about that for a moment. It's cosine of zero. We imagine on there, x on there, it's clearly just going to be x. And then we're just going to end up with zero there, x sine zero is obviously zero. We got x sine zero, oh, that's going to be zero. We just end up with x, y. So when we rotate through zero degrees, it's kind of intuitive. We start with x and y, we rotate through zero degrees, we're going to get the same thing. We get x of y out. So obviously this formula does make some sense for zero degrees. You could try it with other angles, but I guess the, the easiest thing to do is to remember that form there. And if you want to go clockwise rather than anti-clockwise, i.e. you want to go that way around, then you just take the transpose of that standard matrix there. So we have found two of our standard matrices. We've found f of s and we have found h of s with its dilution there. Okay, so now let's do the tricky one, the orthogonal projection onto a line. So our line that we want to orthogonally project it onto is y equals negative 3x. So g from r2 to r2 is orthogonal projection onto this line, and we want to find g of s. So first off, let us consider... Oops, it's just going underneath the lamp there. There we go, we're all good. Let's consider u as being a vector, and u is the direction vector of the line y equals negative 3x. Why do we want a direction vector? Well, really, what our end goal is we've got a line that's probably negative 3x. I don't know if you know, some reference system is probably about right, but uh, what we imagine doing is we say, well, okay, here's some, here's some vector. I'm going to call this vector p. So just like the letter P for now. And then we're going to take that vector P and we're going to 
project it orthogonally down onto the line y, negative 3x. We obviously need this direction vector here because we're going to take the dot product of p with that one there to get that projection onto that line. Because really what we're finding is the horizontal component of p on that particular line. That's really what projection is. It's the shadow that it casts on that line. So that's why it's really important to find the direction vector here. And not only just the direction vector, but the unit direction vector. And the unit direction vector will have length 1, and it'll be really nice because that way we're able to get the best uh, standard matrix out by considering that. So we're going to have to find the direction vector, then normalize it in order to get the result out that we want. So let's consider just u in general. Well, it's really simple. Uh, in fact, so simple it might not even be immediately obvious, but for every 1x we have a decrease in 3y. That's our direction vector there. Now if we work out the modulus of this, and that's important because we obviously want it to be a unit direction vector, we want to find u hat. u hat is the unit direction vector of the line y equals negative 3x. And u hat is obviously just going to be equal to what our u was, but we're going to divide by the length of u there. Okay, so u hat, well, what we do is we take these components and we square them to obviously work out their magnitude. doesn't matter it's negative because 3 squared is the same as negative 3 squared. We get square root 10. Well, it's really simple to find u hat. u hat is just this. Oh, God doesn't like me today. Let me just move the camera there. So that's our u hat. That's our unit direction in um, for that line there. That's our direction vector of unit length 1. And now we're going to consider how we take the dot product. So I'm going to go over the page here. And I'm just going to start off by saying, well, okay, we know u hat is equal to 1 square root 10, negative 3 on square root 10. And now what we want to do is we want to consider the transformation. So I'm going to say g of p, my input vector is p. And that's going to be equal to gxy, because obviously we're working in R2. We're going to have an x component and a y component, because yeah, we're in a two-dimension Euclidean space. And that's going to be equal to, well, when we think about it, we're going to take p, we're going to dot it. And it's just like our normal projection. We've got our u hat, it's normalized. We're all good, we're all happy. And this is just a normal projection formula, yeah? We're just dotting P, our input vector, with the direction vector, and projecting it down onto that line. And it'll probably make more sense in a moment. But what we're going to do now is we're going to say, well, obviously P, because it's just in R2, it's really just XY. <laughs> it's just a vector with two components. That we're putting into our function g. And that function g is going to do that projection for us. So it's x, y, two components. We're dotting that with u hat, that unit direction vector along that line. That's really just a scalar. What we're doing is we're scalar multiplying. That's really what happens when we project things onto lines. Do the dot product, we multiply the components x on root 10, negative 3y on root 10, multiplied by u hat. Well, we then simply imagine this as being a scalar. Shouldn't have been a comma there, sorry, because this is a scalar. And then with its components, 1 on root 10, negative 3 on root 10, what we end up getting that scalar there, and we multiply it by our two vector components here. Okay, so multiplying through, we get x take 3y on 10, so square root 10 times square root 10, it's just going to be 10, and I'm just multiplying it by 1 in there, so that's our first component. Then we multiply that scalar by the second one here, get negative 3, lots of x take 3y on 10 again. And then that in turn is equal to, when we simplify it, we just expand out this bracket. So we're going to get negative 3x plus 9y on 10. 